Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Beasley, and I'm a trustee of the Burdett Trust, and I chair their grant committee. So uh, a real welcome to those people that are in the hall and to all the people that we know are dialing in online. So well done for those of you that got up early. It's 8.15 here in South Africa, so people have been up really early to get here. And uh, for those online, thank you so much for joining us. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get on to the, the programme. Um, first of all, just make sure you keep your valuables with you. Don't leave them around. This is quite a busy campus, so keep them with you. Um, just make sure you've located an exit door just in case there's no fire drill. We're not expecting to evacuate, but you always never know. So just make sure you've got an exit door near you. There are health and safety officers on site. So if there's any problem, just let us know and we can sort it. Um, and just to know that there is, those of you that live here know it, there's load sharing here. So if the electricity goes off, you just have to give it a few minutes for it to come back on again. And we will just have to pause and, and wait for that. We're, we, it's always not always easy to know when that's going to happen. So um, uh, we'll see how we go. We are going to be filming this event, but it's only going to be the speakers and us so if you haven't told your boss you're here don't worry nobody will see you no <laughs> nobody will see you and when we come to questions we've got this mic and we've got one handheld mic so the best way for you to do it is to ask the questions and either myself or one of the other facilities will repeat it so that the people online know what the question is otherwise they won't be able to to hear it so uh, I think that sort of does the housekeeping and um uh, and we're all set for a great morning. So the Burdett Trust that is supporting this uh, uh, symposium um, on connecting excellence in nursing research, we're really delighted to be supporting it. Uh, some of you will know a little bit about Burdett. Um, it's a, a UK based, it's a grant giving charity that particularly supports nurses and midwives and indeed HPs as well. And it supports them in developing leadership capacity, research capacity, focusing on nurse and midwifery uh, led projects which improve health and health care so uh, we've got a fairly well endowed charity there are some people in the room that have had some of our grants uh, we uh, support clearly quite a lot in the UK but we've also got a global reach as well so we're really really delighted that we've been able to work together here and to put on this symposium before the conference uh, in a way proper starts tomorrow um, it's a real privilege, isn't it, to be here in Cape Town. What a fabulous city it is. We, Shirley and I, the chief executive of um, Burdett, came in on Friday night, Saturday morning. So we've had two or three days to look around this absolutely beautiful place. What a beautiful, beautiful city. So we're thrilled that we're here in Cape Town. And what a marvellous campus it is here at the university. Another real privilege to be here. So a big thank you to the university for helping us put on this um, symposium. And we're really, really delighted to be here. Um, so I guess for all of us, really, I mean, who'd have thought a year or so ago that we'd ever be meeting again? We've had such a hard couple of years, haven't we? Wherever we've been with, with COVID, uh, nobody knowing really what, what, what was going to happen. It was certainly in the UK, it became quite a feature. If you managed to speak to somebody who stood at your gate, so you never thought you'd ever be travelling again, never thought you'd ever be together again. So it's so good that we've managed to put on what was this delayed conference and and put it on and we're here together in person i mean we have got absolutely amazing at zoom and teams and all those other platforms haven't we that we never thought we'd ever do you know uh, my grandchildren came into their own you know which was press this button grandma and it'll work you know um and we've done an awful lot around that but it's not quite the same as being able to meet in person because what you don't get is what was happening this morning. People having little chats, seeing each other again after a long time, you know, lots of things you can do with technology and that's really good, but it's fantastic that we're together. And I think the other thing, given the, the focus in the next few days around research, I mean, how fantastic that the research capacity globally um, meant that we were able to develop vaccines so quickly, develop treatments so quickly. I mean, who would ever have thought it? And I think some of the scientists didn't think it sometimes. Certainly most of the politicians didn't. And quite a lot of all of us thought, how, how will that happen? And we would still be in a very parlous state without the research that led to those things. 
you know, we're not through it completely yet. Who knows what's ahead of us? But at least we're through the worst of hopefully the worst of it but uh, um, a lot of it based on the research and many nurses midwives and others are part of that research community that that led to those developments so uh, fantastic um, but we all know there's much more to do we all know that still too many people nurses midwives hps work in the research community but they don't lead it all the time. They sometimes the benefit doesn't spread to the communities communities it should. And I mean, not only did we learn such a lot and we put into practice things around vaccines and treatment, but equally importantly, and it's probably particularly true when we stand on this continent, how you get those treatments to people. You know, it's one thing having a vaccine. It's no good if you haven't got any sort of structure that takes it out to where people need it. And most of the time at the forefront of those um outreaches are nurses going out into communities uh reaching people talking to them about their fears so that they feel more confident about accepting treatment and that's as important as having the vaccine you know without you know just having that it's not there's not some magical thing i mean in the uk we still had a, uh, several communities that needed a lot of personal help to come to terms with whether they felt the vaccine was safe, whether they felt it fitted with their religious faith and beliefs. And we and the vast majority of people that were working with those communities were nurses, really opening up the infrastructure. So lots more to do. And um, today, here we are. We've got a really packed morning, uh, a time when we can really explore how to influence policy, how to be there so that nurses are around the table, influencing policy and taking the lead. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy the morning and then the workshops just as great. So we're going to, I'm going to make sure that we keep to time because I know what it's like when nurses get together. They chat on for a long time. <laughs> That's very, very good. But if we're not careful, we won't be we're going to finish. So the speakers know they are going to get a bit of a two minute warning and I'm going to be sitting at the side. But if you don't finish, I will sort of, well, I'd like to say leap up, but with my dodgy knee, that's probably an exaggeration. I will stagger to my feet and make sure that um, that you're um, that you finish on time. So I'm going to be quite uh, clear because what I also want to make sure is that we get a few questions in and we don't just have people speaking. Um, and so with more ado, we're going to start off with the first session of the morning. And, and can I welcome Professor Letitia Rispel? You'll see in your programme uh, a, a, an awful lot about her. Um, she's got, um, she has a research chair. She's a professor of public health um, at, at the University uh, of um, here. And I'm not here, in Joburg. Oh, in Joburg. Well, when I say here, I mean South Africa. South Africa. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Here in South Africa for me. So exactly. And uh, she has done such important work around the workforce and healthcare. Welcome, Letitia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have set my timer, Dame uh, Chris, <laughs> for 15 minutes. So I just want to check. It's the green button, Arancha. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, what I'm going to, to do, and I'll set my timer now. So um, Arancha asked me and, and Prof um, Aisha um, asked me to talk about several things. They wanted me to look to take a nursing research lens to talk about the unique contribution of nurses doing research um, and how it influences uh, the, the evidence for, uh, you know, for that, they also wanted me to, um, and Chris, I hope you, yes, they wanted me also to highlight issues of responsiveness, how should nurses and nursing research be responsive, and of course, how should that research importantly influence both current and global population um, health. Um, and ultimately, it's about impact, impact on the health system, um, impact on um, uh, population health uh, improvements. That's ultimately, we should never forget that whatever we do, ultimately, it's to make a difference and to have an impact in people's lives. 
So what I hope to do, um, um, I want to share with you, I guess, a bit of my personal story, how I got involved in, in, in research, and then highlight, conclude the presentation with some key um, uh, my pearls of wisdom, which I hope will be helpful for uh, for all of you. So I chose, I guess, what was the what I call the path less traveled. Um, so when I qualified, actually at the University of Cape Town, um, I won't tell you when, although you can see I'm I'm a wise person. Um, when I qualified at the University of Cape Town, I worked in the um, a cardiac intensive care unit at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, which is not far, a few kilometers down the road from the from the university. And so I was a highly effective um, intensive care nurse. I actually did the pediatric nursing course at Red Cross Hospital. Um, but that was the irony is I, I was exposed to people who were activists at the time we we had um we were in the throes of a very repressive apartheid system in in south africa that discriminated against people on the basis of of race and the irony for me was that i was working in an intensive care unit that was um and i was taking care of children and I was very good, I can tell you, that the surgeons actually wanted me to be on duty, especially when there was a very um, a, um, a case, a very complex case. But we were dealing with these children with cardiac, with with uh, uh, congenital anomalies, um, and on the other hand, uh, black children in particular were dying. Uh, um, because of lack of access to vaccination, and they were dying of, of, of severe malnutrition conditions like marasmus and kwashiorkor that I'm sure many of you don't even know what, uh, what they mean. And so I was given an opportunity to work in a newly established grant funded unit called the Center for Health Policy. And I started there in 1988. And between 1988 and, and 1996, um, I was. I had the privilege to be involved in um, research that health systems research that looked at what a post-apartheid healthcare system uh, would look like, and some of the policies that found their way into the transformation of the the 1997 white paper on the transformation of the health system. I had the privilege to be involved in the development of some of those policies. I left the university in 1996, September 1996 to be exact, um, to um, work in the new uh, Gauteng Department of Health, uh, where I was largely responsible for implementation of the new progressive um, health policies and the research background helped, but I was the first nurse to become a head of a provincial health department in the new democracy. And I returned to, um, the academy in, in 2006, initially in the Human Sciences Research Council, and then I returned to Wits University, back to the Center for Health Policy. At the end of 2016, I um, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, I got a South African research chair um, on the health workforce, and that's what I've been working on. So um, I... Um, uh, I will just share with you very quickly, my chair focuses on the health workforce. I have three research areas and two cross-cutting areas. I'm not gonna deal with it a lot uh, because I, I see I have only a few minutes left. And so, but the envisaged outcomes is basically to contribute to the, to the improved performance of the health system. Because as we all know, the health workforce and Dame Beasley was talking about it as at the core of, of, of providing not only services, but at the core of population health improvements. Um, I know for many of you want to develop a research career, if you're working in a university, you have to look at that intersection between research, teaching, and what I call academic citizenship. And I just want to highlight the intersection of these areas, that it's not just research, but in many instances, it's how, how research influences um, teaching and vice versa, and also your academic citizenship, such as participation in fora like this. So my um, reflections, um, firstly, it's around um, um, 
you know, I've had the privilege, I've had people who have mentored me, and I think I've done well. I'm one of the few nurses with a Saatchi chair, uh, um, tier one. Um, in December this year, I'm going to uh, graduate with a Doctor of Science in Medicine at Wits University. And three days later, I'll get an honorary doctorate from UCT, my alma mater. So what are some of the tips that I want to share with you? The first, of, of course, is that I think we have to recognize that the playing fields are not equal, that it often depends on geography, it depends on gender, um, it depends on ethnicity in some, uh, you know, in some contexts. Uh, um, and and we need to, to kind of recognize those inequalities that we have to deal with. Um, but one of my pearls of, of, of pieces that I want to share with you is that in some instances you have to volunteer and it might not necessarily be for some of the more glamorous things. So people like Aisha or Elizabeth or I didn't get there from the beginning. It was often a lot of hard work involved. And sometimes you have to be prepared to do some of the, the kind of non, what I call uh, um, the, the, the non glamorous things, you know, and that often gives you huge opportunities. Uh, sometimes it's a case of serendipity that it just happens, uh, something happens at the right time. Uh, um, it also depends on um, your reputation. One of the things I always say to people that I mentor is to make sure that you always keep your word. You know, that that's the most important thing and that you um, you deliver quality work. You always do your best. So even if your best is not the best of somebody else, that you actually make sure of, um, you know, of that. Networks are very important and all of you already have those networks through the Badet Trust. And then, of course, also a balance between enjoying the opportunities, but also at the same time, a dealing, finding ways of dealing with those microaggressions, which come our way sometimes as women, especially as women of color, and those of us from low and middle income countries. Uh, Dame, um, oh, okay, actually, I have a good five minutes. Don't know why I'm rushing. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, you, you, you see the problem. So I can spend a little bit more time because my last two slides are really the most important slides and they talk to you. Somehow you, you see the problem of old age. I couldn't see and it looked like I was already it felt I was only talking for two minutes, which was true. But on my from the side of my eye, it looked that I had been talking for 13 minutes. So that's why I was rushing. I didn't want to be the first one to get into your bad books. <laughs> So, um, so what are my, my pearls of wisdom for you is that things that work for me, the first one is planning an organization. Those of you that know me well will know that I'm almost anal about planning. I plan my work, I plan my personal and professional development. I plan even fun and relaxation. So I've diarized my gym sessions, you know, and those ones, nobody comes in the way unless it's really an emergency. Um, the, the second one is the importance of re reflexivity and self-care. Sometimes, especially as, as women, and apologies to the men in the, in the audience, we tend to think that it's selfish for us if we actually take care of ourselves. Yet, it's only possible, and I think it's also the case for nurses, it's only possible to take care of others when you're actually able to take care of yourself and when you have the energy uh, um, and, you know, and the, the headspace to do so. Uh, the third one I would say um, is around self-discipline. It's to, um, to identify and be aware of distractions and how to manage um, you know, these. So as we know, it's, it's possible, especially that you could sit on the internet for the whole day and at the end of the day, you wonder what you've actually achieved. You know? So it's around you know, being aware, which of course links to the earlier point about reflexivity. Um, I would say it's very important to invest in supportive networks and relationships. Those people that are going to look out for your well-being, that's going to tap you on your shoulder and to say, you know, um, you don't look well today or you're particularly irritable, you know, what's the matter? Uh, and they might just remind you to have a, to have a rest. Um, importantly, I want to say to you that one size doesn't fit all. So don't 
try and do what the person next door uh, you know, does. It's around to say, find out what works best for you. Um, uh, um, and, and as I've said um, um, already, your journey is going to be different than anybody else's to actually be important around, uh, around that. Research and any work that you do requires passion. You must have passion and enjoy what you're actually doing. Otherwise, you're not able to do it to the best of your um, ability. Um, I, and, and, and part of that passion uh, um, and commitment is in the first instance, if you work in a clinical setting or if you're doing research on clinical setting, it's around, you know, how do you have passion and commitment to make a difference to the lives of the patients that you take care of, uh, to communities. But I also think part of sometimes uh, uh, where we as, as, as nurses undermine ourselves is that we're not when we're not supportive of our own colleagues so part of that passion and commitment it's around how do we take care of our patients and communities how do we take care of our colleagues and how do we take care of ourselves so it's really uh, um, an, an, an integrated cycle of course as I said uh, um, and what Arancha and Aisha wanted me to talk about. It's also around how do we make sure that there's impact uh, both in the health system, uh, because the health system enables improved population health and then ultimately population health improvement. So my very last, last slide, the key messages, and you can forget everything else that I've told you, is, is firstly is to recognize your power as change makers. Sometimes I think we forget about our own power to make a uh, to make a difference even if that difference is just to one person that person in turn could make a difference to somebody else's life and in that way you have a multiply effect the second as uh, um, aspect that i want to share with you is to focus on those things under your control you know it can become quite overwhelming especially when you look at the politics not just nationally but also internationally and then lastly, to use the power of research to make a difference. The issue that they wanted me to talk about is I would say learn from mistakes, learn from others, um, adapt, uh, innovate, and of course, um, evaluate. Um, and, and then just to conclude by acknowledging uh, um, Aisha and um, Arancha, and then just my colleagues um, who've made some uh, comments um, in, uh, on the presentation, and and then just if if that if you want to hear uh, read a bit more about my chair, that's the website. And if you want to be in touch with me, please feel free to send me an email. And um, and I have one minute left, so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Letitia set the bar, hasn't she? But both in terms of what a fantastic start to the morning and she kept her time. So, you know, I don't want to be that rigorous a thing. You know, 30 seconds won't mean you're doomed. But um, uh, that was such a good start to the morning, both listening to a little of Letitia's own story, which I always think is very powerful, very easy when you see people that are so... Um, uh, skilled in their career and very experienced to think that somehow they were born that way you know that they, you know they came from their mother and there they were you know uh, and uh, the, I haven't met any of those so there's a long journey so so thank you Letitia so we're going and you will have a chance for questions we're going to do the three presentations then we'll have some questions uh, at the end time for questions so I'm really delighted to welcome Elizabeth Eero with us this morning we're so privileged to have Eero who is the uh, Elizabeth who is the um, chief nurse at the World Health Organization she's got such a experience both for nurses and a pol policy maker and we're delighted that she's joining us this morning so welcome Elizabeth. Oh, that's going to be a really tough act to follow, <laughs> keeping the time and, um, yeah, not get into um, Christine's uh, bad books for the morning. <laughs> Do I have a presentation? Yes. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. Um, and I have to say thank you to the 
Burdett Trust for Nursing for the sponsorship and for actually the opportunity to really see what more we could do as a professional group in advancing and strengthening um, our agenda, our global agenda, as well as our national agenda. So it's a, it's a, I'm really privileged to, to be here this morning. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I was asked to talk about, you know, how do you influence health policy? And I kind of um, thought this is uh, something very critical because we constantly hear ourselves wanting to have a seat at the table of policy making, wanting to take our own chairs to the table. Um, and not quite sure what that actually means or whether people really understand what that means. It's not such a, an easy uh, process. Um, as some of you from a country um, perspective will, will kind of, um, uh, you know, recognize, um, we come from different contexts within our backgrounds. So how, how your structure or your infrastructure is set up, how your health workforce is set up, how your government is set up, um, actually a whole lot of impact on that table, what happens at that table. So I'm kind of really quite pleased to be sharing with you uh, today a global policy experience where some of you have been a big part of. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Oh, 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 it jumped. Okay, let me just see. Okay, yeah. be patient. That's it. <clears throat> So I kind of uh, wanted to, to look at my, my this presentation as an opportunity to really look at what that global experience looks like. Um, and maybe you'll recognize yourself in that global experience. But I think what's really also important is what's happening at the country level. Um, you know, the Director General for WHO has made it his uh, agenda to really make the, you know, to see the impact of the work that WHO is doing at the country level and really wanting to hear from the country as to what's important to them. I think we're so used to having a top down kind of approach to policy developments. Um, but really, the, the, it, this is a huge gap in terms of implementation because you don't have that buy-in uh, right at the outset. So we've really kind of been really honoured to work with Dr. Tedros in the last few years because that's been his focus. And of course, coming from a country, um, a Ministry of Health, you know, I, I really recognise the importance of, of hearing, you know, what nurses and what midwives are saying at the country level. Um, so. There are huge differences, and I think you'll probably recognize that already in terms of uh, what you're doing, um, because it can be all very nice and structured and process-oriented, uh, integrated approaches, but then you hit a snag when you're actually in a country for various reasons. So it'd be nice to kind of go through some of that with you today to see where does that uh, policy development leading into implementation falls for some of us at the country level. And sometimes also not just at the country level, but also within the organizations that we're working for. It has a huge impacts. Um, when we talk about this global experience, I have to say it reminds me of um, when I started at WHO. I started in 2018 as the chief nursing officer. And I came at a time when there was this global movement. I think it's a Nursing Now campaign yeah. in 2018. It was launched. It was one of the first things I, I, I participated in and really privileged to be timely um, and, and felt the, the shift in terms of the, you know, the work that nurses were doing. Um, and so I have to really thank, uh, again, you know, the Burdett uh, group for, for really supporting that movement. And WHO and ICN were, were also collaborators in, 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 in that movement or in that campaign. It was a three-year campaign, but it really, really... Um, you could really feel the shift even at the global level as to what's happening at country level with this ignition of interest to really mobilize and to you know, find our voice and, and say what nurses can actually do to um, advance uh, health outcomes within their countries. So within that context, all this was happening. And then, of course, we had the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife in 2020, another really key kind of um, Experience, global experience, followed by the International Year of the Health and Care Workers in 2021. And within all of that, we get COVID, we're dealing with COVID, but at the same time, we're also developing two key policy um, documents 
that is now informing the way we take forward the strength in nursing and midwifery um, in countries. So we had the first state of the world's nursing report and, and followed in 2021 with the third state of the world's midwifery report. And within that policy agenda, the data and the evidence, we kind of moved to developing these recommendations, these policy priority recommendations um, that's been endorsed with at the World Health Assembly um, which is the nursing and the global strategic direction for nursing and midwifery. So this, this, all this global experience um, came about because of you, those in the country level. Um, but I have to say, having worked with countries now, some of them are questioning their own data. So where is their data? Uh, you know, where did this come from? No, that's not true. That's not us. Yeah. Actually, Somebody in an office ticked all the boxes and uh, made it look good because we can't afford not to look good in the global scene. So these are things that are popping up. <laughs> so, so I think that's really interesting. I think it's good that we did the process. We, we consulted. We did a whole lot of work around, you know, finding out what actually exists, what's a nursing world like out there. So we did all of that, but still gaps. And so... Um, as I said, you know, last year, the World Health Assembly, this policy uh, priorities was endorsed at the highest level of a, a World Health Organization um, meeting, the World Health Assembly, which is the, the governing body. If you understand WHO, WHO actually works for member states. There's 194 member countries that meet every year in Geneva or globally uh, or virtually now. Um, and, and it's a decision-making body. Now, at that meeting last year, they endorsed this document, which, you know, for, for nurses and midwives is a really big, big opportunity because it makes us have to report to them. Uh, it was endorsed by member states. We need to report back to them as to what have you done in the last five years. Um, so, you know, it, it makes us the, it puts also the onus on us as nurses, as professional groups, as regulators, as educators, as government <laughs> chief nursing and midwifery officers to actually follow through on those policy options. Um, just to kind of like take us back in terms of, you know, how do you influence policy? And I think this is a theory of change that was used to um, work through the first state of the world's um, nursing report, as well as the strategic direction for nursing and midwifery. So broad, broad engagement with um, uh, the, the key, you know, key stakeholders, uh, with collaborating centers, with professional bodies, with regulators, with educators, uh, researchers, uh, non-government organizations, um, ministries of health. Um, so really, really kind of huge kind of agenda. And then some of you in this room were, I think, in this on the steering group, on the steering committee for, for those reports. Um, so how do you influence policy? And so we've gone through, you know, collecting the data, ensuring that we do have data. There's a national health workforce account in countries that are managed by a focal point. So our job also has been to encourage the nurses to be their focal point, government chief nurses to be there, uh, you know, to make sure that we're getting the right data, the right information. And it's not just a tick in the box as we have now found out uh, what's happening. Um, and then of course the policy dialogue, which needs to, to be something that continues. I think that was a big gap, I think, in terms of moving to implementation. And I have to say in a, 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 a small research we did, and I'm really pleased Mary, Chief Nursing Officer, former Chief Nursing Officer for Kenya is here because she's one of the, the, the Chief Nursing Officers who helped us to kind of, you know, bring the reality on the ground and, and to kind of say, Elizabeth, you know, you hold these meetings every two years, we come to us and then you disappear or we disappear and you don't hear back from, from us, you know. Uh, two years later, you're calling us again, you know, come to another meeting, you know, we're talking about reports. <laughs> this is not good enough. Um, and so it was listening to these voices and these colleagues telling us that actually we need to continue to keep connected, not just bring people to a meeting where we're reporting on something that perhaps, you know, our heart was not in there. 
um, and because our country priorities has changed in the last two years. Um, and so the connection was, was really a, an important thing for, for WHO to listen to. And so we created this community of practice, this virtual community of practice as a result of those conversations with people like Mary um, to, to keep nurses connected. Um, and so on the platform right now, we have over 5,000, I think over 5,000 users on the platform um, and, and nurses are talking to each other. And WHO is making sure that we've got um, guidelines, uh, updated policies to be shared with nurses and midwives in countries to make a difference in the work that they are doing. And it's a place also where they can go to to ask questions, do surveys, do whatever they want. It's their platform. So I think the vision is that the users, this is for the users, and they will determine how this platform will be um, uh, evolving into um, so it's a it's a resource really to support uh, the work that WHO is doing, as well as to support the work that nurses and midwives in countries are doing. Um, so we've used this policy this theory of change as a, a way of um, a, pro, a framework um, in terms of managing uh, the work that we do. And it's also uh, been a, also a framework to use the um, implementation and monitoring. Uh, so, you know, of course, you know, we keep tabs on those two yearly uh, forums that we have, um, which is a, a government chief nursing and midwifery, midwifery officers forum, and as well as the nursing uh, and midwifery leaders um, from uh, members uh, of ICN and also ICM, we call it the triad meeting. Um, so these are every two years we host these meetings. As well, of course, you know, we've got the National Health Workforce Account, which is something that's, you know, reviewed uh, every, every year. So on an annual basis, we should be collecting data and monitoring those data um, within that platform. So, <clears throat> again, you know, using that platform, um, and as, as you can see, it, it does kind of, you know, address these uh, SDGs, at the, these four key SDGs. Um, <clears throat> And, and in the work that we're doing. So this is showcasing, you know, the contribution that nurses and midwives are making towards the SDGs. I think I was saying, you know, we wake up and not think about the SDGs. We go to work, do our work. We don't think about the SDGs, but you're making a huge difference to the SDGs. Um, and this is some of those uh, those areas of work that you're doing, whether it's in education, whether it's in clinical practice and research. We're, you're making a difference uh, and making a contribution. We just need to be able to collect those uh, those uh, evidence um, and then to kind of showcase those evidence. <clears throat> just just really a quick overview of uh, what those policy options are as um, you know going forward. You know what's been asked of uh, of us. Uh, in terms of making this uh, this difference uh, to education, to creating jobs, to um, leadership, as well as to service delivery. So just quickly, again, you know, those policy priority options, um, you know, just in summary, uh, what they are. Um, but as I said, you know, it's not just about having those policies available. It's what, what do we do as, an, as a group to support countries to advance these, these policy options. And, you know, countries may only be able to advance one of these. Who knows? I mean, that's up to a country context to actually say, this is a priority for us and this is what we want to, uh, to showcase. And this is what we want to report on at the next bi um, biennial uh, meetings. So it's about reporting. Again, as I said, the process around reporting, really critical. So it's not just about, Having the policy, I think the WHO with its focus around impact at country level is actually keeping a focus on what's happening in countries <clears throat> and, um, you know, around data collection, around data analysis and around the policy dialogue. We've developed toolkits for that to kind of happen with it, you know, to support countries as well as, you know, how do you then, you know, get your ministers to um, uh, 
to change policies within your countries? What's the narrative that needs to kind of, you know, be supporting you in that endeavor? How do we go about supporting you to actually make those differences? It's huge because not all government chief nursing and midwifery officers have the infrastructure around them to support the work that they do or the responsibility uh, and, and autonomy to, to make change. So there, there's constant challenges around um, the role itself. Um, and in some countries, the role is actually, you know, held by a non-nurse. Um, so the nurse is actually reporting to somebody who's a non-nurse. Um, so there's a whole lot of uh, uh, areas that we will recognize. <clears throat> so as I said, again, you know, it's about, um, you know, how do we make the difference, um, recognizing the, the gaps that exist. And so, you know, I come to a country experience. Um, as many of you know, I was a secretary of uh, health in my country before I came to WHO. Um, and I remember when I first went into the role and I was sitting with all the heads of ministries and the Crown Law Office was uh, giving us um, a prep as to guidelines as to what kind of, how to do the policy and legislative uh, guidelines uh, that she will only accept if it gets done. And of course, I'm new to the role. And then I wait to see afterwards. And I went to see her and I said, you know, could you tell me where the health documents, you know, legislations are in terms of your pile of uh, work that you're doing? And she said, Elizabeth, it's right down here at the bottom because it's not government's priority. And I'm not like, you're kidding. <laughs> now, that came from a, a solicitor general advising me. So, so it was then about, you know, for me at that time, it was about re-looking, what can I change? What can I do then? Follow her guidelines, rewrite everything, reprioritize what does my minister think is a priority and make that happen. Um, and so for me, that first year of in, being in that role was about changing the Ministry of Health Act because a lot of other work kind of fell underneath that act. All the nursing stuff fell underneath that act if we could get it right. And that helped to elevate some of the work and the policy changes during my time at the Ministry of Health. But these are, you know, you continue to have your broad engagements, but you need that last D. You need the dollar. You need the investment to actually make a, make a difference in all the data, the dialogue, and the decision making, um, and that's usually uh, you know uh, what kind of throws policies out the window. At the same time, in countries, there's also the political changes. Ministers, governments change, and repriority of our policies also kick in place. So I think you know our role and our place in terms of influencing policy is to be focused, focus on our agenda and continue to collect the data, continue to analyze the data, and continue to provide the right narratives to those in government to listen to why nurses and midwives make a huge difference in terms of population health. So thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's always fascinating, isn't it, to see the link between global country and it's always easy I think when you're in your organization to sort of think none of it really has any impact but it's amazing what the impact is both ways and understanding those connections is really important thank you very much Elizabeth I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you afterwards so the third of our um, um, speakers this morning in the first section uh, delighted to welcome uh, Professor Aisha Holloway who's the Chair of Nursing Studies at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She's a great friend to me, as well as a colleague. Uh, and as well as all the work uh, uh, Aisha has done in terms of her nursing and a, a clinical and academic career, she's a fantastic networker. So, you know, if you want to know about networking, listen to what Aisha's going to say. So uh, welcome very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, so probably the highlight of my career has been following Elizabeth Eru onto the stage <laughs> and Letitia. I'm <laughs> thinking, okay, after these two, it might be pretty tough, but I'm going to try um, and bring it down a level. We've had quite high level 
um, presentations from our two speakers. Um, so I'm now going to thinking, well, you're all inspired now by these two amazing um, women. And you're thinking, well, how am I going to be able to do this? So I'm going to give you a little preview of the workshop that will be happening later on this morning. And this is about networking. Something that I myself um, used to see other people doing and thinking, well, I'm not sure I'm that good at this. So um, I'm going to give you a little, the green button? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, okay. It takes a moment. Okay, I'll try. Okay. So one of the things I think as nurses and individuals, when we're operating in this space, probably outside of our comfort zone, the two speakers have talked about influencing, about positioning, about being involved in these areas that are probably outside our clinical, usual clinical practice. And for me, it's always about understanding who you are. That is the key thing. So before we get to all these other high level areas, we need to understand who we are and what our purpose is. And this leads nicely into everyone has a story to tell. And I know Elizabeth's doing a fantastic workshop on this later on. And I wanted to give you some insight into who I am as an individual before I talk specifically about the theories behind networking and trying to see networking as part of your role. So for me, someone asked me this morning, where are you from? You're from Scotland. And I said, well, I'm kind of from Scotland. And some of you who know Scotland will know that the thistle is our national flower. And then suddenly we have these black pharaohs. And actually my background, although I have a Scottish accent, I actually am half Sudanese and half Scottish. And my father is from the Nubian tribes, which were in Wadi Halfa. And at school, we were taught about the pharaohs, Tutankhamun. And I got very irate because I thought, well, actually, there are more pyramids in Sudan. And the black pharaohs were there before Tutankhamun was ever there. So that's who I am. And I really am very proud of that heritage. And I think that really has... I would say, driven the focus that I have at work around those who are marginalised, those who suffer inequalities, because in the 1970s, it was quite unusual to be mixed race in Scotland. I was the only child at school who my friends used to say, that girl with the brown tights. <laughs> like, brown tights? I haven't got any brown tights on. So I learned to grow up being a bit different to other people. And I think that's what really has driven me in my nursing career and driven me forward and helped me understand what my passion is and the difference I want to make. And I, the reason I tell you this story is because I think that's what you will be doing when you're thinking about what is your purpose. And when you're networking and introducing yourself to people, you have to be able to convey that message. Why would a minister of health listen to you? Why would the chief exec of a charity listen to you? They will listen to you when they understand what your purpose is and you make that connection. Okay, so this was me. I always wanted to be a nurse. Um, and you see, I saw education as the way ahead. So that's me, my first day at school with my satchel on my back, ready to go and be an amazing nurse. And I don't know if I'm that amazing, but I definitely have loved the career I've had so far and it's been hugely rewarding. Now, when you're thinking about networking, you maybe think, well, that's not for me. That's for people who are extrovert. That's for people who, um, you know, know what they're doing and they've got lots of experience. I'm just a nurse. Well, here's the thing, you have to get out of that comfort zone, okay? If you follow the, my experience, if you follow the crowd and you just sit in your office or sit in your clinical area and you don't come to events like this, nothing is ever going to change. We have to be the change makers and we've already heard that this morning. Take risks, feel that you are going into an area that you don't know, but don't let that put you off, okay? Because you are representing your patients. You're advocating for them, for better care for them, their families in better conditions. 
Now, I can't take any credit for the work I'm going to share with you today. This was um, something I read in the Harvard Business Review. I was lucky enough actually to be funded by a Burdett scholarship um, several years ago. This is before I knew Shirley. Um, and I went to Harvard Business School and then I thought, oh, I'm going to read this um, this magazine, it's a little treat I give myself every now and again. And I saw this paper on networking and it really impressed me. And I teach this to some of my students. I don't know, Tantri was one of my master's students and a PhD student of mine. Um, and this is about how we frame networking. This is part of our job. It's not something we do at nice conferences although you are going to be doing it today, tomorrow and the day after, as a social interaction. You are doing networking because you are following your purpose. And it may not necessarily be networking that will benefit you. You might end up being a broker where you are networking other people. And again, we'll talk a bit about this this afternoon or later on this morning when we do the workshop. Core to all forms of networking relationships. It's a fundamental element of human behavior. We have to connect, we have to form relationships, okay? In this paper, it categorized networking three key areas, operational, personal, and strategic. And the ones that I really want to focus on this morning are personal and strategic. Operational, you're already in that environment anyway. That is, a networking group of people that you probably inhabit every day within your work area. The personal one is the one that boosts your professional, professional development and personal development. And that's quite key in terms of developing you further on the career ladder to a place of influence developing yourself. And then the strategic one relates to more where we are operating in terms of influencing policy, whether that be in your hospital area or at government level. So the operational one, largely we feel very comfortable in that area. It's the one where we are with colleagues, these relationships happen outside of our own doing really, because we have that network around us in the work environment. OK, um, the quality of those relationships and the depth of those, however, are built on trust and mutual respect for each other. And that will have to happen at every level. So we're building on that mutual trust. But this is our comfort zone, the area where we are not really pushing ourselves forward. We're just going along with the flow. We know everyone around us. Nobody's really challenging us and we feel quite comfortable. It's quite a nice, it's like putting on an old pair of slippers. Okay. It's lovely there, but I don't want you to stay there. I want you to move forward. And I think that's why you're here today. You're here today because the comfort zone is not enough for you. And there is a famous song. I love the song from the greatest showman. I'm not a very good. I'm good at a lot of things, but singing is not one of them, sadly. So you can watch the movie. The Greatest Showman, there is a song called Never Enough. And that, I think, is me. I listen to that song and it never is enough when I'm, you know, thinking about things that I'm passionate about and I want to change. And I think, I and I think Elizabeth said, or Letitia, one person, if, you, if it's one person's life that you impact or one colleague's life that you impact, then you have done your job that day. That is what nursing is. Isn't it? We didn't come into nursing for any other reason than this something in you makes you want to make a difference to someone's life. And the only way you will do that is by going out of your comfort zone. OK, so let's think about this personal networking. Wonderful. Old slippers. Get them on. We like that. How do you now move on? Hang on. Okay, I want to go to, sorry, I want to go back to this one. I think one of the things that put individuals off and nurses off is thinking, well, I'm so busy. I'm really busy with work. I'm really busy with life. I just haven't got the time to do networking on top of this. But actually, 
if you want to make that difference in the long run, investing in this part of your personal development, so integrating it within, it's not an add-on, you will then start to reap the benefits. It's a little bit like when we make the um, the argument for investment in nursing, you know, our workforce is not a cost, it's it's an investment and we will see a greater return on investment if we invest in it. It's the same thing here. If you spend time and again, genuinely building relationships with people where there's a common purpose, that will reap benefits in the long term, not just for you personally. Remember, networking is not for personal gain. Networking is about hopefully brokering relationships with other people or for other people and networking that wider group that you have so that we can have that critical mass growing. OK, so one person alone is not going to make the change. So these contacts will provide important referrals. OK. Development for support, such as coaching and mentoring. It is true, nobody here got here on their own. Let me tell you, I was able to have this, for me, a wonderful, fulfilling career because other people gave me opportunities. Other people lifted me up. Other people said, Aisha, why don't you do this? Aisha, you can do this. Let's give you an opportunity. And they didn't wait till I was in you know, my 50s, I'm that now, um, and a couple more. Um, but it was when I was much younger, when I wasn't really sure that I could actually do it, but they believed in me. And that's what you have the opportunity to do. So making the personal networking meaningful, do that when you're doing it for the right reasons when you have your purpose made clear and you're acting as a broker for others, not just yourself. If we think about strategic networking, that's where you're going to transform yourself and your network into something where you can really reach a higher level of influence and authority. And strategic networking will be networking outside of nursing, okay? Nurses often operate in silos. We love speaking to each other about our profession. It's great because we're all agreeing with each other, but we need to get outside of nursing. The key for us, and Letitia and I were talking about in the taxi, our collaborators and our supporters are outside of nursing also. And until we start having conversations with those people who will be our supporters and our advocates, we're not really going to see that traction. So let's think about that strategic networking in a different way, at a different level, okay? Because that will give us the power that we need to leverage and hold the positions of change that we want to. This is work, okay? Engaging with stakeholders, building allies, assessing the political landscape a bit like when Elizabeth has told you, health is at the bottom. Okay, what am I going to do? Who do I need to work with? What can I do to get the biggest gain? Identifying like-minded individuals, but not always. It's good to be challenged. And seek out those outside of your existing network. This table here, I'm hoping that these slides will be available, will they? Yep. Okay, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is a great little slide and it categorizes the different levels where you find people and what their purpose is. And we'll pick this up in the workshop later on. But I don't want to worry about that. Golden rules. Okay, give, not take. The best network workers give to their network. They don't take away from it. Build a relationship that matters. It's not about being an extrovert. You can be an introvert and it's a skill and one that takes practice. It's like a muscle. I'm being told to stop now, but I've got two lovely slides. If opportunity, this is my opportunity to go for another 30 seconds, doesn't knock. Ms. Beasley says we're friends. I don't know how long that'll last. Doesn't knock, build a door. And if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. So we'll be changing you in this workshop later on this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aisha. It was, uh, as you can say, uh, as I said, she's a very skilled network. And as Aisha said, it's networking isn't a sort of luxury you do when you've got time and, you know, 
sort of it's a nice to have it's absolutely central to both your own personal development but also how you influence and how you take things forward and uh, uh, and I think uh, some everybody in the room would sort of recognize that and I know you're going to explore more later right we've got 15 minutes now for questions have we got the other mic that yeah, sorry. We're just right. We're just bringing down the other mic down. Um, so I'll let the speakers stay where they are because it's it's not too much room to keep maneuvering here. So um, if so, if you want to ask a question, please say sort of who you are and where you're from briefly, and then the question. Remember, I'll repeat the question so those online can um, hear what it is before people speak. So who wants to ask the first question? Right, here we are. Yeah. Um, Lisa. Thank you. I Thank, uh, really enjoyed the speakers. Um, Aisha, a question for you is, uh, I love that uh, networking. I've never heard it explained in such a thorough way, so thank you for that. What professional group do you think is the best at networking out there? I mean, is it medics? Is it engineers? Is it business entrepreneurs? Do you have, do you have a view about that? It just made me think as I was sort of sitting and listening. Uh, I don't know. Yes, so because at least had the microphone, they would have heard that question. Oh, thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, well, what's really interesting, if you read the evidence around this um, in this paper, um, at Harvard, they did an experiment where they had business um, students who were doing MBAs. And they said, OK, this exercise, you're going to network in this room. And they put tags on them so they could watch out who they were networking. And the most networked person at the end of the afternoon was the waiter. <laughs> <laughs> because, and every the great thing is the workshops, everybody will be able to come to both workshops. So you're all going to hear this. So what's really interesting, I don't think it's about who, which professions are the best. And I think as nurses, we need to make ourselves the best at this. I think it's about individuals. So it doesn't matter what profession you're from, I think understanding your purpose, understanding that this is an integrated part of your personal professional development, and then looking at it in a more technical way, for me, this made me make sense of it. And I think that's what we need to do. And we need to be integrating this into our education for pre-registration nurses so that it's part of that holistic part of who we are uh, as a nurse. So I don't think there's, there may well be professions, but I think we saw at the business school, these were people who were in business and should know how to do it. But what you do is you seek out like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of cloning going on because I'm just going to speak to somebody who looks like me, sounds like me. And actually networking is not about that. It's about who's out there, who has a similar agenda, who I think could collaborate and who is an individual that we could work together. So I think that's the, that's the answer. But I think now today, you can now go and explain this to other people in this way and we can start growing a profession that uses this as a skill to help us leverage and get what it is we need to change. Hang on to the microphone, uh, Aisha, because we have a, a question from our online colleagues. So this is Sabine from Sweden. Uh, and the question to Aisha is, how should you start networking and bringing together nurses? Should we start locally or nationally? with building nursing networks and bringing together nurses? Oh, this is quite good. This is the second question I think I know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sabine, thank you so much for your question. And actually, I would say the best example of that is the Nursing Now campaign. And you can read the final report. Mm. Um, if you look up Agents of Change, and it tells the story of that campaign. And I know the key people are here, Lisa, who currently still leads on the Nightingale Challenge, Chris, yourself, um, Shirley, Elizabeth. And what we really saw was, we saw networking happening at every level. Grassroots, right here we go. <laughs> you know, grassroots nurses were just taking this on board. And they were doing it at every level, all the way up to, I know our colleagues in Sweden, they, there were nurses at really high level doing the networking as well. So I think it doesn't necessarily need to be at one level. I think we need this at every level. Um, I hope that answers yeah. your question, Sabine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asha. Uh, Natasha. Hi. 
Hello, Natasha North University of Cape Town. Um, this is a question prompted by something that Letitia shared, um, but I would actually love to put it as a question for a very quick response from each of the speakers. Letitia, you spoke about nurses and all of us needing to deal with situations where there might be negativity directed towards us. Um, there might be politics, there might be toxicity, um, there may be elements of discrimination um, when we try to take our seats at the policy table um, or the research table. I would love to hear just very briefly from each of the speakers, if that's possible, <laughs> When you found yourselves in situations where you've had to sit at a table where you were being made to feel not welcome, what do you dig into to power you through that situation and find your determination to participate? Fantastic. Let's have the microphone down. Why don't we start off with Letitia? All right, start with somebody else. Well, let's start off... <laughs> Oh, poor Aisha, you just, Aisha, sit, for those of you online, Aisha sitting in the wrong place. <laughs> there we are. Off you go, Aisha. Gosh, it's like triple impact. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, I and I think you got a glimpse of it. This is very personal in terms of my growing up being mixed race in a country that that wasn't really the norm. So by default, um, you know, that's been a, an interesting journey for me, I would say. Um, so digging deep, um, I'm quite a resilient person. And, you know, um, I think when I've been in those situations, they're very interesting. And I, I, I think I've reflected on it in terms of not owning other people's um, stuff, shall I call it. And, you know, People behave in the way they behave, but I can't own that. I can only be in control of my behaviour and how, what my values are and my moral compass. Um, and the great book by Bill George, Two North, check it out. Um, and I think that's what, you know, if I leave some, a meeting feeling happy with the way I've behaved, then that's all I can be in control of. Um, so, Natasha, I would say... Um, it's around acknowledging yourself and your own abilities because it's very easy to feel that you the you the problem rather than the person often who, who uh, you know who's the the perpetrator if I can if I can call it like that. So I I will give you um, maybe one example. Um, of how I dealt with the with the situation when I was in the Gauteng Department of Health, and um, the 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 provincial minister at the time decided to move me to the portfolio of chief director for hospital services, and the directors who reported to me were all white men who had worked in the old Transvaal Provincial Administration, which is the sort of pre a precursor to the Gauteng Department of Health. And for a week, the, the, the one director thought that it, the, the change shouldn't have happened and I wasn't competent to do the job and didn't speak to me literally for a week, you know, wouldn't even acknowledge me. And so my strategy was then to call each of the directors individually. I spoke to them, you know, and asked them to tell me what they were doing and they, about their portfolios. Um, and at the end of my conversations with all of them, I sort of had a broader meeting. I summarized what were the key things that I thought um, I would do. And then I embarked on a series of individual visits to every single hospital in Gauteng, where those hospitals that were under their jurisdiction, I asked them to accompany me. And so, so I think it's about, in that instance, I had the moral high ground. And so that earned um, uh, a sort of a newfound respect uh, from the, you know, from the individual concerned. We we'll never apologize, but I think through his sort of actions, like trying to be helpful and giving me directions, those were before the days of Google, you know, it, um, it kind of like changed certainly his, his uh, perception. And I'm hoping that he learned something from the experience. Uh, 
Um, thank you for the question. I think for me, um, uh, on, on reflection, probably when I uh, became the, the Secretary of Health, I was the first nurse to take up that role, uh, first woman to take up that role. Um, and so there was some kind of undercurrents. Um, <clears throat> but I think for me, the, the strength for me was knowing I could do the job. I felt I had uh, great uh, grounded knowledge from nursing right through, you know, from the clinical focus to public health, uh, to administration and management. I felt like kind of like, you know, my basket was full. Um, and so for me to address those kind of, um, that situation was just really through action, not words, just action. And I think, you know, what, what um, that set me as, as, a, as a basis. One year later, after I'd taken on the role, two men, two doctors approached me and said that they had some doubts. They shared with me. It was just kind of like, oh, my gosh, really? A year ago when, when I was appointed, <laughs> they didn't think that I could do the job. Um, and so for me, it was about action more than, than anything. Um, but knowing that your basket is also full with all your, you know, skill sets and knowledge. Um, and that was the way for me to deal with that situation. Um, Lisa just sort of passed on that one so we can do one more question. Just to add to that, very, very briefly, uh, when I was worked at the regional level, <coughs> excuse me, um, it was when HIV and AIDS were really beginning to go. And there was a big, important meeting that was all chaired by, uh, and all the members were white, doctor scientists at the national level and I was sent along as the nurse on it and they all they were fairly bemused really as to why I was there for all sorts of reasons and uh, and it was hugely intimidating I think that was the most intimidating they weren't they weren't nasty they, it was just intimidating and I learned two really good tips first of all read the papers and secondly don't leave that meeting without asking or making a contribution every time you know, if you sit there mute and say nothing, you you know, people will just go over you. So you need some tips around how do you get in there and make the inference. Time for one last question. Uh, and this is from Marion Lynch uh, online uh, about gender influence is the power. What top tips do you have for women to break through conversations and spaces where women are the minority? So would you like to start, Lisa? No, no, no. <laughs> that was a brilliant example. I mean, I, th I think for me, um, it's really important to, I'm kind of echoing what you said, because yeah. I think it's about being well prepared, going in with confidence, and actually not being afraid actually to speak up and challenge, but making sure you know, you, you know what you're talking about. I think yeah. that's the, we've seen that with COVID and people getting up on stage and not having the data, not having the right dialogue, and not being in a position to answer the question honestly and with integrity. And I think that third thing is just as important as the previous two. Yeah. Uh, any, Elizabeth, no, Letitia? To make this the last comment yeah. i would just add know the rules really well yeah and then sometimes you must have the courage to speak truth to power yeah, exactly yeah you no know, right yeah yeah so i think those are really good top tips around having because i think if you've got some um if you've got some plans some tips and some coping mechanisms it gets you focused otherwise i think you can just sit there thinking like well, I could do it like a rabbit in a headlight thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Whereas I think uh, actually having some of that preparation beforehand means you go in there thinking, no, I can make a contribution and I am going to make a contribution. It doesn't have to be marvellous the whole time. You don't have to be, but you do need to speak. Yeah. Did you want uh, yes. one last comment from Aisha? No, no. Yes, I'm, I'm using this as an example because this, this is about research capacity building and the evidence. And um, we have a programme in Edinburgh for nurses post-grad and one of the courses is research and it's the one they, they're less familiar with, less comfortable with. And interestingly, after the course, we were doing an evaluation. This is just very recently in the last six months. And the nurse said clinically, she previous to doing the program, she would go to the multidisciplinary meetings and she wouldn't be able to, um, you know, 
she felt unable to speak. Now she was there and she went with the evidence. Yeah. And she was then able to, she presented the evidence and everyone listened to her. So data and evidence often offer power. Thank you very much. I think that was a really, really good session. Thank you very much. And um, remember, there are going to be workshops with Elizabeth and Aisha. You can explore some of these things in more detail after the coffee break. So we're going to move on to the next session. I'm going to just introduce Lisa and then she'll introduce her team. So um, Lisa Bellis Pratt has got a lot of experience in education workforce in the UK, currently Pro Vice Chancellor at uh, Coventry University and also has taken on the next iteration, if you like, of Nursing Now. So we're delighted about that. Um, and she's going to lead a conversation uh, with some colleagues. So over to you. Brilliant. Good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a real treat to be here and, and even more of a treat to be spending time with three amazing early mid-career nurses that have stepped into, into research and, and really made an impact. So I'd like to introduce them down to the stage and then they're going to introduce themselves. And the idea here is to have a real conversation with these three amazing individuals about their journey and top tips that they're going to offer to you about the, the power and potential, I think, actually, of, of research and its impact. So if you'd like to come down onto the stage, uh, we'll get you introduced. There will also be opportunity for questions at the end, so feel free to scribble some notes. Is the, is, the, is the microphone available? Just so we can, it's easy for the individuals to probably have that. Yeah, and then I can sit down too. Perfect. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay, we'll start with you. Super. Does that sound, can everybody hear okay? Brilliant. Lovely. It's nice to sit down. I've not got my slippers on. I thought about those comfortable slippers and it's only half nine. You know? <laughs> okay, Tantri, over to you. So who you are and where, what you're up to today. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my name is Tantri and I'm from Indonesia. I work as a lecturer and also the head of a nursing school in a private Islamic university in Indonesia. And uh, before that, I qualified as a nurse in 2009. And then I decided, oh, I, I, I think clinical placement is not for me. So because I want to make more impact by doing more research. So I need to uh, develop my research skill. Then I decided to continue my education, further my education in master uh, degree in Edinburgh University from 2012 to 2013. And that was actually my first time going abroad. So yeah. It was a huge, huge uh, challenge for me at that time. And then I finished my master degree. I came back uh, home. Uh, previously, I worked as a lecturer assistant in the university, so I continued to work there. But then I decided to come back for the PhD. I started in 2015 under Aisha supervision. And then uh, I, I did research about cardiac rehabilitation for women because uh, heart disease is the major uh, disease in Indonesia, but still like... Uh, considered as a male disease. So I looked into that issue. So I finished my PhD in 2019 and I came back to Indonesia where I, because for my master degree and also my, for my PhD is well fully fund, funded scholarship from the government. So basically, actually, I live from one scholarship to the other scholarship. Uh, and then yeah, I returned to Indonesia and I start to work again in the university. And uh, I joined also in the, one of the research group uh, about tobacco control. So it's uh, Muhammadiyah Tobacco Control Center. And I work as an advocacy team at that time. Uh, we start doing lots of uh, do lots of advocacy with the local government, with the central government, and of course to do the advocacy, we need the data and evidence. So we do lots of research in that area as well in tobacco control. And in 2021, yeah, I started my role as the head of the nursing school in the uh, in in the university. So that's a bit of my story. 
Thanks, Tantri. So, I, I mean, for me, um, I think we'll tell the individual stories and ask questions and then move on because we don't want to lose it. I mean, how amazing that you um, moved to different countries and secured scholarships and so many um, early career nurses that I talk to with the, the network that we run. You know, where do I get funding from? What countries can I go to? So what tips would you give to people that want to follow this path in terms of seeking funding and, and finding the right country for you? Because because I think that's a massive risk. And certainly you've not got your slippers on when you're thinking of stepping into another country. So what, what tips would you give the audience? Yeah, I think the first tip is actually just, uh, you know, embrace the opportunity. I really love the challenge myself. I don't want to stay in the my comfort zone for too long. So I always look for the opportunities at that time because I don't have my own funding. So I need to look for the opportunities. I keep searching for the scholarship. So uh, for the my 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 first scholarship, actually it's a long hard work because yeah. I graduated in 2009, 2009 qualified as a nurse at that time. And at that time, actually I plan to do master degree in Australia because oh you know it's close to home it's not too far and then I tried to apply for the scholarship from the Australian government but it failed many times like every year I applied and I failed I failed I failed so I just look into like oh what's going on I need to improve my English so I spent like my first two years salary actually is for improving my English to take the course like because yeah, when I was a student, I couldn't afford it to learn English. So I actually just investing in like English. When I graduated, I got the, the job in the university as a lecturer assistant. So that helped me a lot. So finally, in 2012, I improved my IELTS score and then I got that 7.5 at that time. So basically that helped me a lot to be mm -hmm. admitted in many universities. So I got like letter of offer from uh, Melbourne, from Monash, from uh, I applied in several UK universities. But then uh, the government said, no, you cannot go to Australia. So the first scholarship that I got is from the Indonesian government. They said, no, it's too expensive in Australia. I need to move somewhere that's cheaper. So I decided, okay, in the UK, I just like Googling what's the best nursing study in the UK. And it came Edinburgh as the yeah. top list. Like <laughs> where, where, yeah. So I decided, okay, it's it's only two months, Lisa. So it's like only two months preparation. And I need to change the direction from Australia to UK with lots of preparation. But finally the scholarship got approved. And then yeah, I moved to the UK for the first time. I was like really uh, I don't know but Edinburgh at all because it's like only two months and I was uh, busy with preparing all the administrative fees and everything so it's uh, totally <laughs> fantastic yeah. I mean and so inspirational um, that's just amazing uh, Tan. and I guess one of the question because it's been a bit of a theme earlier on today is we all face stigma and challenges and often we don't succeed the first time do we what what's your what what was your act did you did you have to overcome uh, stigma did people look at you and what is she doing here does she deserve to be here that imposter syndrome that unfortunately many of us feel throughout particular times in our career so was that something that you had to think about yeah yeah actually with? it happened like I'm a woman and then like people like why you need to do like you are only a nurse like why you need to take like a master degree that's in Indonesia is still the stigma at that time because in 2009 like you can get easily like you get a job in the hospital or anything that why, why you need to go master degree and then even the people questioning again my decision why you need to do PhD when you finish your PhD you will get like become a doctor or what like it's not it's not even like not considered as a nurse so like uh so yeah but but I I just I agree with uh, what uh, Elizabeth said, just try through your action and mm -hmm. then it will speak louder than words so like, yeah, you know, like, this is my path that I choose and I work hard for it and then I'll just show it to people that yeah, mm -hmm. this what can I achieve I leave my comfort zone so it's really taking risks actually Lisa like just to leave your comfort zone as Aisha mentioned many times I really totally agree with that because when you stay in your comfort zone for too long it doesn't not going to change you're not going to improve you so I just like okay I need to move from the, this comfort zone and then yeah by my journey through my journey I uh, met so many people great networking and then I wouldn't be able to be here today if I wouldn't make this the decision that day so <laughs> fantastic yeah. well I think deserves a big round of applause um 
and and maybe have a think while we're listening to to our other fantastic colleagues maybe what questions you might have when we come to the q and a session because these are really golden opportunities to hear firsthand how it is to drive through some of the challenges and opportunities of doing amazing things which clearly you're doing so thank you Tantra you can take a breath now uh, <laughs> uh, we now move to Daniela so it's your turn Daniela so over I to you because I don't speak English but the message is important so I try I do my best I'm Dani I'm from Brazil uh, I'm my background is in health technology and nurse, and uh, I met the research later in my life. <laughs> I worked 20 years uh, uh, in management and patient care, and then I go to I went to Argentina to study my master's degree in health and clinical eff effectiveness <laughs> as, um, in research methods. And I worked there uh, since the since uh, the last eleven years. I worked to EX with uh, research, and it's very difficult in certain the uh, environment because in this moment I I was the only nurse. All people uh, physicians. And uh, ask me is the same uh, we said uh, uh, Sotantri, how one nurse work in research. Yeah. You have degree? How you stay here with us? So I start my way, my uh, how a aunt, a little uh, steps. And the, I think the only form to uh, show my capacity and the, if a nurse is capable to be here, it's working and work, work, work. And uh, it's not, not about the, uh, my only work. If I, I feel the necessity to share this, uh, this knowledge and come back to the teaching because in Brazil I I have teaching in the nursing school, so I come back to teaching and I I needed to share. It's possible uh, make research and uh, um, from this uh, from this practice because my challenge is the make the research and integrate it into the practice. You know, yeah. a choice. I'm a, a nurse in patient care or I'm a researcher, yeah. I'm a management. No, I need uh, uh, all areas integrated yeah. because it's the feedback. You know? mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard the way, but I think um, we... Um, you or we or you, uh, our challenge is um, make the, the path easier for the other nurses. Yeah. So uh, I'm suffering now <laughs> with the English. <laughs> for us. Yes. Yeah. But it's important yeah. because I like my students in the other conference stay here. Yeah. And share and yeah. share with you uh, other experience mm. thanks Daniela I mean that very much speaks to some of the stuff that Aisha talked to Elizabeth and Letitia about you're kind of not doing it for you that's superficially you might be you've got to do it for you because you've got to be motivated but actually you're doing it for a much bigger prize often uh, so for you maybe 10 or 20 years time what's the prize of this blazing a trail working with people outside of your comfort zone probably surprising your family what on earth are they up to all of a sudden changing careers uh, you know now at this time what what do you want to see maybe 10 or 15 years down the line for the next generation of people that that, that tread your path it's it's, it's difficult it's uh, in my case it's very very strange because I, I like 
study and I I search when I mix my background. And I I went to Argentina because there I I found this opportunity. But uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the journal or uh, the way uh, um, it's, it's necessary uh, moving and uh, change. Uh, <laughs> Arancha, <laughs> please. Deja la yeah. familia. Family? Yes. Deja la familia atrás. Oh, Yes. Yeah. The yeah. Family behind, and start the 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 new uh, a new journey. A new journey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But now uh, in Brazil, have uh, now I see or I feeling is in Brazil the nursing it's a uh, one step uh, ahead. Brilliant. Yes. And in, in Argentina, I feeling uh, it's we. Don't uh, don't have uh, recognize it. Yeah, and uh, the new generation needs to start to integrate the research uh, from this uh, degree. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, the system there is very uh, is different because the university is a second level to nursing. Yes. So many nurses don't complete the university and don't have contact with a uh, uh, researcher. Yeah. So yeah. It's very important to uh, motivate to uh, finish the, the degree. Yeah. And integrate. The, yeah. And uh, one thing is, is I, 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 I feeling uh, my mission in this in Zara is uh, invite other nurses, young nurses. Yeah. Uh, how I have uh, one student here. Oh, it's the new generation <laughs> here. <laughs> and I fight uh, Yeah. Don't feeling uh, intimidate yeah. is very important. Yeah. And uh, reach out. Yeah. To help and to ask to help. Fantastic. That's fantastic. So, uh, so I think I think uh, Danielle did brilliant because uh, her English is much better than our collective Brazil. I'm sure, apart with the exception of yourself, perhaps you know. <laughs> we can to be here. Yeah, I think. I mean, wow. I mean, what more is there to say from a leadership that has a follower? Yeah. I mean, I'm almost that, you know, that's here alongside her. And I guess that's another dynamic to the leadership. Um, you know, it's how do you create followers? When are you a follower? When are you a leader? Can you be both? Of course you can. And they're both really powerful. I think the other area that um, certainly in the, in the UK and I mean, I'm fascinated with the Nursing Now Challenge Network. We've got nearly 60,000 early career nurses and midwives engaged. Nearly all of them want to play a part in research. And I think that is a real game changer to 10, 20 years ago when it might have been one module that you studied. Um, but it's so amazing, this sort of movement around uh, research. And I think something that many education programs are doing at the undergraduate level is how do you get research enriched learning? So, you know, it's not intimidating, but it's in a lot of what you do at many different levels. And I think, Danielle, what you're doing is really enriched the work and actually you know working with other disciplines more and more in many countries we hear about nurses working with engineers you know uh, around intensive care equipment because actually engineers build this equipment but they don't ask the nurses how user friendly is it and then they wonder when there's errors at play so I, I think you're absolutely blazing that trail and and we'll meet other followers and fellow leaders through networking uh you'll be amazed at probably how many more there are out there that you can start to get that groundswell of change uh you know happening across many countries but thank you so much and thank you for speaking so eloquently uh, it, 
Yeah, well, you wouldn't know it, would you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning? So another round of applause for Daniela. Okay, so we now move on move on to Faith, and uh, Faith is, has been a fantastic inspiration to me uh, personally and professionally, because actually she has been in the nursing now from day one. Uh, when we went out to Uganda, I met uh, Faith in person, and she is forever challenging the status quo. She chairs the Challenges Committee for Africa. Uh, she gets involved in all sorts of amazing initiatives. And uh, I just can't wait to see where Faith will be a decade from now. But yeah. over to you, Faith. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's so humbling, that I'm an inspiration and all that. So my name is Faith Nawaji. I'm a Ugandan, born and raised there. I've always been a quiet girl who sits somewhere behind and listens what people are saying and all that, but I always put up my hand and say something and something like that. So my story in research um, began at my undergraduate level. I went to Macquarie University back in Uganda. And at that point in time, we used to study inter interdisciplinarily, like doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and all that, all our basic years, we used to study together and all that. Then we would separate um, at the clinical time, doctors would go alone, nurses go alone, and all that. But as a young girl wanting to join the health sector, I just didn't know how to describe that. I wanted to do research. I wanted to innovate, I wanted to see change and all that. So at the point in time, of course, in high school, there was a lot of uh, forensic science things. There was a, a Siri, is it CFI? I don't remember the name so well, but I watched that series so much and they would <laughs> do forensic science. So they would search and things like that. So I always thought I want to find out and create change and all that. So I didn't know how to describe that. So when I was applying to join university, I went to a lawyer. My mom phoned a lawyer to advise me and things like that and went to a career event. So then they told me, medicine will give you all the clinical things and everyone goes to health world to be a doctor I mean it's the prestige and all that mm -hmm. but then this lawyer told me actually nursing will give you all the exposure you need to to grow to innovate and the Ugandan bachelors of nursing at that time in my times there was two course units on research two course one course unit on health management and administration and things like that. So if you would ask me, I would say, I want projects, I want to find out and things like that. Mm. So to cut the long story short, I joined Macquarie University as a nurse. And while there, there was a medical education partnership initiative, a big funding from USID. And they were teaching us students how to do research, scientific writing, grant writing, and all that. So I got all the exposure I needed at the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. And I would do this through co-curricular. There was a research and writers club and things like that. So I got all the exposure, not to be a nurse who is just collecting data for others and do the research. And they publish and all that. The exposure was to lead innovation, to lead research and all that. But that's not what I was seeing that nurses were doing and all that. And we were the front line. So we were the best people to create this evidence because we understand the detail of what is it is in there. So I started to write mini grants. By the time I graduated in my bachelor's, I had some few mini grants. I had published a little bit and I got all this mentorship but much of the mentorship was from the doctors and mm. all that, because many of the nurses felt low of themselves, but there was a significant nurse, Dr. Rose, and she always encouraged me and encouraged me and all that. 
So I also worked up country to get the exposure of how do I deal with being a nurse up country? But I've always wanted to innovate, to create a change and to address the gaps and things like that. So I worked at the Johns Hopkins Research Collaboration there. And the culture there, it's doctors who are the PIs and the study mm. coordinators, but I was the study manager and the coordinator for the NIHR01 bone mineral density program. And I led these developed 11 sites and things like that. And then I'm like, but I have to link this with education. I have to link this with leadership. I have to innovate. So I left my job and I felt I needed to study. So I did my master's, but I needed a master's that would allow me to remain in Africa. Because if I, that's the best place I would create change and all that. So I met a lady called Anna when I went to Brazil to do a, a presentation about a One Health project that I had created and all that. And I've always wanted to create exposure in internationalization for health professions, education, and all that. So I told her, okay, I could help you build this in Africa and all that. I went back home, did my everything of the John Ho Johns Hopkins work and things like that. Then at the point in time when I wanted to start my master's, she told me, Faith, the concept you wrote has gotten approved. So you need to run this. I'm like, okay, but I need my master's. I'm not going to leave Africa. I'm going to do my master's <laughs> online. I'm going to pay for my master's because mm -hmm. that's the best way I could do it and things like that. And I will have to run this project. To cut the long story short, I would needed to create evidence in that, run the program in 12 African countries, in 56 training institutions, created the evidence, today the paper is out. And uh, along that, I've been always writing mini grants and all that. And I felt as a nurse, you're the best person to produce evidence mm -hmm. because you're in the fields everywhere. Mm -hmm. But then I also thought people would trust me more when I'm an example to training and all that. So I did a clinical epidemiology and biostat still with UCSF in the US, but it was done in Uganda as a site. And then I decided to go for my PhD so that I can ground these skills, but also mentor other young girls, other nurses, that it's okay to innovate mm. and it's okay to be a nurse and be bright. Mm. It's okay to sit on the table, but you can't do this alone. You need people to network with. You need people to give you a space and I'm always grateful for all those people that gave me a, a platform to talk, a platform to be me and a platform to, to, to impact others yeah. and all that. So then I get to the Nursing Now Challenge and my issue always around nursing was we say so many things about African nursing and everything. And then we say there is no leadership training, no this, this and that. Indeed, it is not there. But I've always said, but what's happening in every African country? And now I have the confidence that I can do things beyond my country to the rest of the world and to the rest of Africa and things like that. So I sat down, I wrote an idea that we need to map nursing leadership and governance across Africa. I talked to Lisa, we link up with Professor Rosie, we apply for the Bad Aid Trust Nursing Grant. And today I'm happy to say that our work is in the process of being published. We were humbled with what we learned in 16 countries. Mm -hmm. And I always look forward to one day being the lead that is working with other professions to develop a nursing research center for excellence where nurses lead this, the research, influence policy, train people to be nurse leaders and nurse research leaders, but also be the exemplary center to nursing health workforce modeling. Um, from there, I then moved on. Now I work for the Foundation of Advancement International Medical Education and Research, and I lead the implementation of the African programs. I hope I didn't shoot over. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Well, I think a round of applause first off. I mean, 
I think maybe many of you are sitting there. Faith, how do you find time for anything else? Because I think this is a real practical challenge, isn't it? When, you know, we, we've got a career, but we've got family, we've got other commitments. Exactly. Are you, I mean, I remember Letitia uh, speaking at the beginning about being really organised. And I love the bit about organising the gym sessions and being as, <laughs> as religious, if you like, about that as anything else. Uh, because we know mental health and well-being is so important to us. And being organised can perhaps help with that a lot of the time. So Faith, what's what's your tips for spinning all of these plates and staying sane um yeah that you that you manage so first of all as a young girl you you also suffer with self-confidence mm. it took me so much time to get used to public speaking I had issues articulating words I put on braces for a very long time and they had retainer stuff down there so when I removed them it almost became difficult to articulate oh. words so things like, like I, I had to teach my tongue to talk again by my tongue going up beyond you know <laughs> and things like that but anyway so it's important to create time to know yourself mm. and your weaknesses and what you struggle with and all that and find support elsewhere that is important to do that of course family and all that quite frankly I didn't start a family many years ago right now and now I'm thinking okay I should start a family and things like that but also I've also prioritized I need me time after doing mm. everything mm. and all that it's good for me to take a walk realize things that make me happy and indulge in those mm. and all that have a good support network around you and also I believe in a higher power like I yeah. pray, you know, and things like that. But I also enjoy the moment because I love what I do. I do it with passion. Yeah. So it's that a fun works. game, you know, yeah. and all that. Fabulous faith. I think I think probably many of us can can resonate with that. If you can achieve if you can achieve those uh, well-being activities and find something that is a power, a higher power, whatever you call it, it, it brings an, an extra dimension, I think, to, to your work. And being passionate is, is uh, it's a must, isn't it? As you just can't sustain it. I think the other thing that I've seen Faith do over, over I feel like over the years now, Faith, with knowing you, um, is you've, you've been able to speak truth to power. And actually, you know, one of the things I think the profession has struggled with is hierarchies, and actually you know you have to do your time before you can be in a position or apply for a job and who do you think you are doing research you know you haven't done this or the other um what, what are your tips for sort of speak talking up if you like and speaking to hierarchy and finding your way in without being dismissed very early because I think this is often a risk you don't even get the chance beyond the hello to to influence what tips would you give the audience so I think it's important to do the Aisha thing, great networking. And uh, if opportunities are not, uh, yeah. We didn't plan this, by the way, but yeah. we should. Like, because it's I like the Aisha, you know, like if opportunities are not opening, then create an, uh, the door so that people can come to you and things yeah. like that. But you need that. You know, in Africa, we have this saying that if you want to go far, go alone. But if you want to go fast, sorry, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Yeah. 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 So don't go alone in this entire situation, but create evidence for people to pay attention to you. So that I should think create something so that people knock at your door for that and everything. My, I will speak to my personal story because that's what I can relate with. I got chance to be mentored by Professor Francis Omaswa. He was, yeah. and all that. And uh, But he pushed me to go to these nice things in my country. And I was inspired to create change and things mm. like that. So back in my country because you have that grounding of being mentored by someone who knows the networks they land yeah. you into that ditch for yeah. you to create a role yeah yeah 
That's really important. And just to say, um, Professor Francis Amazwa is a very influential medical figure, I think, um, in, in, in Uganda and beyond. And so that's really interesting, isn't it? Because often other professions can lift us as well, if we can find the way in. And, and I, you know, I think sometimes it's a double edged sword with other professions, because sometimes we feel a bit, oh, you know, they're stealing the thunder, perhaps. But actually, if you can find your way in, we're always stronger together. And I'd, I'd like just to indulge you an extra five minutes with Faith that's got an idea about the Hippocratic Oath that you take and how that at the moment for you is very uniprofessional when you qualify. But actually, should we have a bigger conversation about it being more interdisciplinary? Because it goes back to the speakers earlier about we mustn't be echo chambers. What, what I learned the most, I think, from nursing now and that wonderful experience of being part of that huge movement was we, we, we do talk to ourselves and we've got to talk to others and do it really quickly quickly and eloquently about what we bring to the table that's not obvious because it's obvious nurses and midwives bring great things to the table but that's not enough actually to get that investment to make that change and get us at the top of the agenda so do you want to just mention this burning yeah. desire you've got so, yeah, around sure. us? so many times in my country I don't know about other countries but I'll but I think I kind of know what is happening globally as well and also in the U.S. and when you finish your training as a nurse, there is this uh, pledge or oath or whatever it is that you take to pledge to serve the population with all your best will and all that. And then from there, you can go to your refrigeratory body and uh, register and things like that. But uh, you take this oath to serve the population with all your heart, mind, and soul, do no harm, and things like that. But in that pledge, we pledge to work with a doctor, you know. But healthcare today has changed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, maybe because my PhD is in interprofessional education and collaborative practice, but that's not the thing. Today, we work interprofessionally, and there is evidence to prove that collaborative practice actually leads to better patient care. And then beyond that, we as nurses or as any other health professional, you're always in this place of you're the problem solver, but you're only human as well. You need to prioritize your own well-being. The school teaches us all these skills to be at the front line, but they don't teach you emotional intelligence. How do you handle this and all that? So that query here is, if you are taking this pledge, maybe let's also pledge to work more than just with a doctor, but as an interprofessional team. Yeah. And also let's pledge to serve the population and support their health, but also as we try prioritize our own well-being. Yeah. So that's the point. Thank you. And actually, before I hand over for questions, I'd just like to, to get the take of you, your view to on that one, because that's a bit off the cuff. But I mean, Danielle, I'm assuming it will speak to you, given that you're working with these fantastic uh, non-health professions. But do you think that would, would float in, in your country with your community? I don't know why. In my country, in, in fact, uh, my in Brazil and in Argentina, because I hear and said to both countries, uh, I think um, we we need uh, work together and. Uh, we need to uh, give the respect the yeah. other the other partner yes yeah because uh, for example the same people uh, if 10 years ago asked me why a nurse wanted to uh, make research some people today invite me and other nurses to work together yeah so the respect is important. Yes. And for me, the respect I, I, I gave, and I think it, the, the all nurses give, uh, with, uh, when we have a good um, base 
Uh, so the capacity is important. Uh, the network is, is important. In Latin America, we don't have many opportunities to grant or uh, uh, help to funding. Uh, mm. we, we have pay <laughs> to education. Yeah. I don't have many opportunities to the, for diffuse, diffusion. Uh, we, our work uh, here, I have, uh, we have uh, um, and Glenda, it's an uh, important uh, uh, coordinated uh, scientific committee and uh, journal. Uh, yeah. Glenda gives space to nursing, uh, to uh, defund, def That's, diffusion yeah. our papers. That's a really but, good point. Uh, maybe the difference in uh, with uh, said uh, faith is we have. Um, uh, yeah, almost uh, don't have opportunities. Yeah, to yeah. nurse. It's, it's breaking through for, those opportunities. For, for us, nursing, it's a patient care. Yeah, and yeah. other other problem. It's uh, important for us. It's, we have a poly job. I job in one, two, or three. Yeah. Yeah. So when I make. When I study, when I, uh, the salary is very low. No. Yeah. Uh, the most of the nurses uh, come from uh, uh, the low and middle uh, income uh, families. Yeah. So uh, the first uh, thing is I need a job, a good yeah. salary. Yeah. And, uh, and then you respect can start the to... other people. And I'm a professional. Yeah. I don't uh, have charity. Yes, the, the, I'm a professional. How the doctor, the nutritionist, and this is this, uh, a challenge in Latin America. Yeah, give the space, give the respect. Yeah, and uh, uh, open opportunities. Yeah, uh, for for this for for me, uh, how a teacher and how a student the. Uh, the burden trust, the global health network is very important because mm -hmm. give me a, a skills, give me opportunities, give yeah. me uh, like a platform a, almost. Platform. Yeah, 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 it's 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 yeah. Um, a enabling, yeah. isn't it? It's just and for us, it's a lot. It's yeah, a really a lot. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 fabulous. So uh, we need to study English as you, and the next time maybe. <laughs> You're doing great. You're yes. doing great. But so, uh, is, hey, is the, the other thing uh, um, we need better salaries, better uh, sure. jobs? To, because yeah. I need to uh, invest in inclusive in the language yeah. because we need to open doors uh, in the language is important for us. Thanks, Danielle. And last but not least on this one, before we go to the audience, what, what's your take on, on what Faith was saying about taking oaths and working with not just doctors or ourselves? What, how would it go down in Indonesia, do you think? Yeah, uh, I think in Indonesia it's like uh, the same. We work, uh, need, we, as a nurse, we need to work multidisciplinary. It's not, it's, it's not only us alone as a nurse, but we need to build relationship network working with other profession and I think uh, that's that's really important and especially if we work in the like policy making like a nurse like uh, like you know in, in Indonesia is still underrepresented in terms of nurse leadership nurse that uh, involved in the politics and stuff it's still really limited in the whole Indonesia it's only one nurse that become the parliament member so it's only one so it's yeah. still like really lack of representative of nursing and you know, if you don't have any representative, you the the nurse. We as a nurse know our profession uh, really the best. The best person that know about our profession is a nurse. So, if you don't have any representative, I think it's it's still like really, you know, it's still like really hard. So yeah, I think improving the capacity of the nurse is uh, really important. Now, the our minister of health, Ministry of Health, has released the number that the number of the nurses in Indonesia is actually surplus. So if in other countries shortage in Indonesia, the quantity is not a problem. So it's like 
more than we need. So we have around 600,000 nurses in Indonesia. But I think the problem is not only the quantity, but it's about the quality. Yeah. I think the quality is, needs to be improved because it's the nurse uh, education. It's become a new business yeah. in yeah. Indonesia. Yeah. They open lots of like, uh, you know, universities and it's not only like because we have several degrees it's like vocational nurse where they only finish the education three years and we have also the professional nurse that's four years in academics and one year's clinical practice so it's still no standard on that and the government is really relaxed about like you know giving the permit for the someone who want to uh, open the, the nursing school and anything it's really really easy easy to do it, easy yeah. to do it. so now the problem is the quality, like how yeah. can you ask to be equal with other probation if the quality itself, they're still like, you know, like it's the question mark because uh, the main aims, like lots of the nursing school is not like, you know, providing good quality of education, but just like, you know, for business, this is the, the new business. And uh, Indonesia alone uh, also now start talking of like, you know, sending the nurse abroad, like, because with the situation, current situation now post pandemic, that shortage of nurse everywhere. And then yeah. the Indonesian government just create like a partnership with the German. Now the German is Germany uh, open, like really uh, open their doors for the nurse in, yeah. uh, from Indonesia to work there. But the main barrier is same, language. Language yeah. has become the main barrier. So it's also another thing. I think investing in language, in nurse, like, uh, you know, if you want to be a global nurse, we can work everywhere. Then, yeah, investing in language, I think it's one of one of the important, important parts. So, yeah, maybe that's the quality, how to improve the quality of our quantity and yeah. that kind of stuff. It's really matter. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I think a round of applause as well. It's really, really well deserved. Um, so I'm I'm very mindful of not getting in Dame Beasley's bad books. So we're doing good. Uh, we've got about uh, ten minutes actually um, to, to, for any questions. So over to the audience now. Bear with us because we've got this mic and we'll move this one around for when you want to get answers from our fantastic um, or, uh, speakers here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I could not ask to speak this morning after you know listen to you. So I'm also from Brazil, also from Latin America, and I could like really recognize myself in all of your words. So thank you so much for that, because this means a lot to me. You know, I always, I face like basically the same issues. I had to pay also for my education, invest like, uh, you know, my savings to go through English and also to be able to be here, like speaking with you today, you know, in another language. So muito obrigada, Daniela. <laughs> é muito importante para as, um, excuse me guys but é muito importante para as enfermeiras brasileiras uh, terem pessoas como você aqui hoje falando em outros idiomas e trazendo um... não, você foi brilhante I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry guys but it's just like I think like we need to do this yeah, you know like absolutely. because it's just a such a like a huge barrier you know in Latin America and I, when I have the opportunity to work with Elizabeth and we are working uh, in the community of practice one of the things that we discussed a lot it was Elizabeth we must to be like this in all languages or as much as languages yeah. is possible you know we need to be to bring the content and yeah. at least in this uh, the six official UN languages, you know because this is the most barrier that we have mm -hmm. so and just quickly to share something with you, when I used to work like as a clinical nurse in primary health care, I used to work in Rio, in Favela da Rocinha, it's one of the big slums, big favelas, like really well knowing, I guess. And we used to be like more than 100 health professionals. And I used to be the only nurse able to speak another language. And they normally people, they don't look at me as a nurse, they, are, they first approach me as a doctor. Uh -huh. Oh, they always thought that I was a medical doctor and not that I was a nurse, you know, like because I was able to speak in another language and I was able to interact with other health professionals that they're, they are coming to visit the clinic. So, and I think like this is such brilliant, you know, like listen to you, like I could keep going talking. I don't have any questions actually. It's fine. And it's fine. <laughs> yes, but it's just a comment because like, I think like it's so important, you know, yeah. like, and, and I do believe that people like they're listening to you that they're not, they are not able to be here today 
and they are listening to you like abroad in those hybrid meetings yeah. that we have the way to do it nowadays. They also feel like me, you know, recognize and the feeling of belonging in a place. Yes. It's one of the important Absolutely. and most true, uh, you know, important things. So, gracias. No. Muito obrigada. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> I think that was a brilliant example of you taking uh, Christine's advice, you know, make sure you say something and, okay. and not only in one language, yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Hi there. Um, yes, good, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mary, Dr. Nandili, former Director of Nursing Services, Kenya, and I uh, have a question to the researchers. But I don't want answers. Oh, <laughs> it's a food for thought. Okay. Okay. Um, as nurses, the we are knowledgeable, and we have the skills. The researchers, you have really uh, made a very good presentation. Um, my concern is most CNOs chief nursing officers uh, have no uh, evidence-based information mm. to formulate policies yeah. and mm. strategies. Yeah. And uh, I've also been in that fix. Yeah. We want to develop documents, we want to develop policies, but we don't have evidence-based information. You as researchers, technocrats, what do you have? On, on table, what plans do you have yeah. to ensure that CNOs receive adequate evidence-based information to support them? Mm. Secondly, uh, we need that information because we cannot develop policies from nowhere. Yes, yeah. So that is a question that I don't want an answer. Think brilliant. about that. Yeah, that's a do you want question. To, do you want to work with the CNOs in your research to engage them? Yeah. To involve them? Think about that. Yeah. Do you want to involve politi po the political way yeah. so that those policies are accepted legally? Yeah. Thank you. That's a brilliant question, Mary. I think it. Mary, I think that's that's definitely one for us all to ponder. You know, I can imagine in the future as we build research capacity and capability that CNO should have an army of researchers around them that actually can be available to call on. Uh, and I think if we look in some countries at our medical profession, they do have more of that. So they can quickly call on that person that's an expert in that field. But a great one, I think, for us all, all to reflect on. There's a question online. So um, we, 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 shall we go to our friend in Tanzania? And just isn't this amazing, the different countries that we've got engaged? It, it always blows my mind. And I think the question there is to the panel. So over to you three. What advice do you have um, to young nurses in reaching our goals and dreams so we're getting tight on time so I think there's some there's there's the three of you to give a, a very quick answer to that question have we got a mic down here but if not don't worry because we can do you want to just speak up to the oh, mic okay. so you're very quick yeah <laughs> okay so uh I think the Thank you. Okay, maybe just a short answer. Uh, the first of all, I think it's important that we set a goal. Like, oh, one 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 person have heard told me, if your dreams doesn't scare you, then that's not high enough. So you need to put your dreams really high. So uh, when you have a dream, and then you make an effort to achieve that dream. So self determination, I think it's really important. And as can, secondly, you need to. Uh, taking risks sometimes and making sacrifice at one yeah. point in your life. And then also like uh, the, the last one is, yeah, you you need to uh, get ready to leave your comfort zone. Maybe that's the so I so, uh, so taking risks, stepping outside of your comfort zones and having scary dreams. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Over to you, Daniela. No, ask for help. Ask because for help. Get, yeah, because that's a good I, one. Too. I start alone. And research uh, don't have alone. We make yeah. research together yeah. in yeah. teamwork. So 
ask uh, uh, help ask for help that's ask for brilliant help. and ask not be proud help. yeah no no uh, walking alone <laughs> perfect thank you faith last but not least yeah um, tips. i'm going to respond to this in the will making sure as young nurses you're not just demanding for change but be the light to change in other words there is a saying that goes you can only be want the light but you can only be the light if you're brave enough to be the light so in other words mm. join the ability to make your policies your government and everything to work and uh, be that engine be the light to enable you move forward join the nursing now challenge africa hub you're welcome <laughs> and everything <Yes>. yeah <laughs> fantastic well a round of applause i think for everybody and then over to then beastly to close thank you so much for being so wonderful i really enjoyed being on the panel with you thank you thank you yeah. Well done. So well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I get the shit. Yeah. Um, well, wasn't that a great session? And it, I mean, with all the difficulties, uh, with all the difficulties, what you had there was people that have, despite everything, managed to carve their way and are on their way to a great career. So that has to be a great encouragement. If it can happen to those three, it can happen to anybody else in the room. So, you know, that's the thing to take away.